In this video, we'll be talking about local thermodynamic equilibrium. Now, up to this point, you've probably seen in a variety of contexts a discussion of thermodynamic equilibrium. Thermodynamic equilibrium is the idea that you've achieved a uniform temperature in a medium. So, for example, assume we had some cloud. If, if this cloud were in total thermodynamic equilibrium, it would have to be completely the same temperature. And that temperature should not be changing with time. So thermodynamic equilibrium means that the derivative of temperature with respect to time is equal to the spatial gradient of the temperature, which is equal to zero. And we can represent this over here by saying that this entire cloud is a uniform temperature. Local thermodynamic equilibrium, on the other hand, relaxes some of these assumptions. Local now means that this cloud can have a spatially varying temperature. It can have a temperature that's a function of position. So for example, if I have a bright star over here heating up this cloud, this cloud can have a spatially varying temperature ranging from a hot temperature here on the irradiated side by the star with a temperature gradient across that cloud going to a lower temperature on the far side of that cloud. So this cloud would not satisfy global thermodynamic equilibrium because there is a temperature gradient across the cloud. However, it can still satisfy local thermodynamic equilibrium. In local thermodynamic equilibrium, the change in temperature at a specific point with respect to time is zero, but that equilibrium temperature that it achieves can still be spatially dependent. And of course, we've clearly relaxed the assumption that the gradient of our temperature field is zero. So why do we bother with local thermodynamic equilibrium? Well, it turns out in real life, systems are very rarely in global thermodynamic equilibrium. Energy is always being transported from one place to another place. If energy weren't being transported, these systems, especially in astronomy, would not be that interesting to study. It's only in local thermodynamic equilibrium that we get to see these energetic processes in progress. So on its face, local thermodynamic equilibrium is a pretty simple concept, but it's worth looking under the hood just a little bit. So when we say temperature, what exactly do we mean? It turns out when we say temperature, there are usually about three different things that we could be talking about. Colloquially, when we say temperature, usually what we mean is the kinetic temperature, which is to say the energy from the thermal motions of molecules. And when molecules have a well-defined kinetic temperature, they end up having a distribution of velocities that's given by a Maxwellian, where the fraction of molecules in any given velocity state, f of v, is given by this expression, which is essentially an exponential with the numerator being the kinetic energy of a molecule, one-half mv squared, and the denominator being kt, the energy available for a given temperature, t. And the terms out front, in particular this 4 pi v squared term, just comes from the degeneracies of how many different velocity states are available at a given magnitude of the velocity v. So that's what a kinetic temperature is. It's the kinetic energy that comes from molecular motion, and you've achieved kinetic thermodynamic equilibrium when your velocity states are given by a Maxwellian. The next kind of temperature you could be talking about is the excitation temperature, Tx. Now excitation temperatures need to be considered when individual atoms or molecules can absorb energy from the environment and store it internally in some excited energy state. For example, you could consider a hydrogen atom here with an electron in its ground state around a proton here. That hydrogen atom could absorb an incoming photon, and if that incoming photon were of the right energy, in this case 10.4 electron volts to be a Lyman alpha photon, this electron could be excited into a higher orbital where it was excited upward by absorbing energy from the environment. Now if we had a cloud with a bunch of hydrogen atoms in it, at any given time some of the hydrogen atoms are going to be in an excited state, some of them are going to be in a ground state. And if these excitation states are in thermodynamic equilibrium, then their ratio is going to be given by a Boltzmann distribution, where the number of atoms in the excited state, state 2, compared to the number of atoms in the ground state, n1, is given by the ratio of the degeneracies of the states, which is how many different ways the atom can be in either the excited, g2, or the ground, g1, state, times an exponential factor, which just like with the Maxwellian distribution, is the ratio of the energy required to be in the state, in this case we've just labeled it delta E, compared to the energy available in the environment at a particular temperature T, which is given by KT here. So a medium is in excitation thermodynamic equilibrium if the ratio of states is given by an exponential with a well-defined temperature Tx. And finally, the third temperature we could be talking about is the radiation temperature, Trad. 
Now, in previous lectures, we've talked about specific intensity as being a useful quantity for examining radiation. Specific intensity, I, at a particular frequency, I nu. In previous lectures, we've shown that the change in specific intensity with optical depth, di nu d tau, is given by the source function of a medium, where the source function is the ratio of the emissivity, j nu, to the absorption, alpha nu, minus the current specific intensity. Now in radiative equilibrium, the total energy absorbed by some element in the medium, like an atom, needs to match the total energy radiated away by that atom. And if we're talking about the total energy, then we're talking about bolometric radiative equilibrium, which just means that the total energy in matches the total energy out. So for example, you could imagine putting a black body out and exposing it to radiation from our sun, and it would heat up a little bit, and eventually it would reach a temperature at which that black body is rating off energy just as quickly as it's absorbing it from the sunlight. But in this case, in bolometric radio equilibrium, you could be radiating off energy at a different frequency than what you're absorbing it at. For example, you could be absorbing primarily yellow light from our sun, but you might achieve thermal equilibrium at a different temperature, a lower temperature, and be radiating it off primarily as infrared light. So that's bolometric radiative equilibrium. But in local thermodynamic equilibrium, another aspect of this local component is that it has to be local in frequency. So LTE, local thermodynamic equilibrium, means that you've achieved radiative balance at a particular frequency. At some frequencies, you could be in local thermodynamic equilibrium. And at other frequencies, you might not be in local thermodynamic equilibrium. But the frequency axis is part of the local aspect of LTE. And in particular, if you're in local thermodynamic equilibrium, then your source function, s nu, becomes the Planck function at that frequency, b nu, where b nu, the Planck function, is given by 2h nu cubed over c squared over e to the h nu over kt minus 1. And as we saw in the derivation of the Planck function, this is essentially, again, the number of degeneracies for a given energy state which is how many different photons for a particular frequency can fit in a fixed area, times an exponential that represents the cutoff for accessible energy states given the amount of energy in the ambient medium. In this case, the exponential is slightly different. It's not just e to the minus h nu over kt, because photons are bosons and obey Bosian statistics, which gives you this minus 1 next to your exponential. So to be clear here, if you're in local thermodynamic equilibrium, your source function at the frequency at which you are in local thermodynamic equilibrium is equal to your Planck function, b nu. Now this is just a statement about your source function. It does not say that you had to be optically thick, for example. And in fact, at a particular location in our cloud, let's say over here, your specific intensity might still be dominated by the background intensity, i nu zero, coming from the star. So this I nu component can be substantial. It doesn't have to be attenuated away. All the local thermodynamic equilibrium says is that locally you are no longer heating up or cooling down because of this radiation. And as you've reprocessed that radiation at this particular frequency, you've now achieved the ratio of emissivity to absorptivity that corresponds to what any black body will achieve. So that's the radiative component of local thermodynamic equilibrium. Now in principle, each of these three different temperatures, the radiation temperature, the kinetic temperature, and the excitation temperature, can be different values. There isn't any a priori reason why the distribution of velocities in the molecules of your cloud have to reflect the same temperature as the source function with which you radiate. Nor do either of these temperatures have to have anything to do necessarily with the Boltzmann distribution of the excited to de-excited states within any of your atoms or molecules. So in principle, these can be different temperatures. And specific mechanisms couple them together. For example, you can couple your radiation and your kinetic temperature. How can you do this? Well, Doppler shifting is one. When you're at a particular kinetic temperature, you'll have a spread in velocities reflecting the Maxwellian velocity distribution. And that means if you're absorbing energy at a particular line transition, then you can now absorb 
photons that are slightly more or slightly less energetic than the center frequency of that line transition. And since a Planck function has a characteristic slope to it, which is frequency, you can couple that slope into the distribution of velocities in your Maxwellian velocity distribution and thereby couple your radiative temperature to your kinetic temperature. Also, if your gas has free charged particles, so for example if you have electrons floating around, then you can have Thomson scattering of the electrons and the photons. And that transfers a little bit of energy between the electrons and the photons. And these electrons can go on with their kinetic energy and bounce off of other atoms and molecules in your gas and transfer that energy into the kinetic energy of the gas. So scattering and other radiative processes within your gas which also include, for example, thermal bremsstrahlung and inverse thermal bremsstrahlung, the scattering of charged particles off of one another to produce photons and to absorb photons during the scattering of charged particles. All of these processes can couple your radiation temperature to the temperature of your gas. Now what about coupling the excitation temperature and the temperature of your gas? Well, that's a bit more straightforward. Your gas achieves a Maxwellian velocity distribution by having collisions that occur between gas molecules exchanging energy between them. These same collisions, if you have internal degrees of freedom to your atoms or molecules, like our hydrogen atom, where you can excite an electron up to a higher energy level, well, collisions provide the energy that can cause that excitation. So collisions between gas molecules directly couple the kinetic temperature of the gas to the excitation temperature of the gas. If your kinetic temperature were higher than your excitation temperature, then more collisions would tend to drive your electrons to the higher energy states than the corresponding de-excitation between these energy states, and that would raise the excitation temperature of this transition in your atoms or molecules. And the reverse can be true. If your excitation temperature is higher, if you have more atoms in the excited energy state, then when these atoms collide together, you can pick up a little extra energy as you exit your collision if the atoms simultaneously de-excite. And that can push energy from your excitations into the kinetic energy of your gas, and that drives the kinetic temperature of the gas to match the excitation temperature. So the final coupling you can have is between the radiation temperature and the excitation temperature. And of course we've already described this process. This is the process of photoabsorption whereby an atom or molecule can absorb a photon and just jump up to the higher energy state. So there are different processes that can couple each of these temperatures. And in local thermodynamic equilibrium, all of these temperatures are coupled. So your radiation temperature matches your kinetic temperature, matches your excitation temperature. And this is one of the signs you're in local thermodynamic equilibrium. So just to review, local thermodynamic equilibrium means that your temperature is not time dependent, although it can be spatially varying. LTE, or local thermodynamic equilibrium, is also frequency dependent. So you can be in LTE at one frequency and not at a different frequency. But at a frequency in which you're in LTE, the radiation temperature, which is the temperature of a black body spectrum, the kinetic temperature, the thermal motion in the molecules or atoms in your gas, and the excitation temperature, the ratio of atoms in the excited and de-excited states, are all the same temperature, T. LTE does not necessarily mean that you've attenuated all the background light. It just means that your medium's source function has become the black body function at that frequency. And remember that LTE doesn't just happen. There have to be specific mechanisms which are coupling each of the three different temperatures. The radiation temperature coupling to the gas temperature through scattering or Doppler broadening or interactions with charged particles in your gas. Your kinetic temperature coupling to your excitation temperature happens through collisions. And the radiation temperature coupling to the excitation temperature happens through photoabsorption. So LTE requires all of these processes to be in effect to form the sides of the triangle that is LTE.